Derrida. You would have heard about his name, Jacques Derrida. He is called the father of deconstruction, and he has taken his uh, uh, points and uh, uh, the uh, baselines from uh, Martin Heidegger. Martin Heidegger. That is why I tell you that he, Martin Heidegger, is a pioneer of deconstruction. But uh, Derrida, Jacques Derrida, is called the father of deconstruction. Okay, but this man. Martin Heidegger is called the pioneer of deconstruction. I tell you that. Here, uh, in structuralism, we saw that the five quotes given by Roland Barthes. In post-structuralism, we have the death of the author by Roland Barthes. When the reader is alive, the author is dead. When a reader is alive, the author is dead. That means the author's intentions are rejected by the reader. The reader gives a different kind of meaning. The reader gives a different kind of uh, interpretations. Okay, that is the point here. The author is dead. The reader is alive. That is why Roland Barthes says the death of the author. Please read this particular essay. I am. Uh, you, you will understand what is a deconstruction really. And then another uh, very very seminal and very important essay is the structure, sign, and the play in the discourse of human sciences by Jacques Derrida, which was presented in 1966 by in Johns Hopkins University. In Johns Hopkins University, actually. Uh, in America, the most of the critics they invited Jack Derrida to give a, a talk on structuralism, but he went to uh, give a talk on post-structuralism by having this essay that is uh, structure, sign, and the play in the discourse of human sciences. What he said is structuralism is over. Mm -hmm. Now we have only post-structuralism that is a deconstruction. He said that. That is why we have that structure. Please, I request you to read this particular uh, essay that is a structure, sign, and the play in the discourse of human sciences. And then he said that there is no outside the text. There is no outside the text in the sense everything is available within the text itself. That means in the language. In the language, one language, one uh, signifier leads to another signifier. This particular signifier leads to another signifier. It goes like a chain. It goes like a chain. And the interpretation, uh, meaning generation is taken place. Meaning generation is taken place. That is why he says uh, in this uh, deconstruction. And then uh, we find that the three key concepts of deconstruction. The first one is difference. Not difference, but difference. Kathleen Wheeler says in her book called Explaining Deconstruction. It is available on the internet, I think, so this particular book. You please read this particular book that is uh, Explaining Deconstruction by Kathleen Wheeler and Siti Indra. Okay, Siti Indra. And then it is, she says that the difference within the sameness is called difference. It's very simple to understand. What is difference? Difference is nothing but the difference within the sameness is called the difference okay and then aporia what is aporia aporia is all readings are provisional all readings are provisional in the sense no reading is final for uh, rl's completeness okay no reading is completed no reading is the final so that is why i tell you that one meaning leads to another meaning that another meaning leads to another meaning it goes like that Okay, this is what we call aporia. And then the third point we have is logocentrism. Logocentrism is also very much important to uh, understand because in the speech, thought, law, reason, and for uh, uh, in, in, in a speech, we are able to deconstruct the concept. So that is why we say that logocentrism. And then uh, this, uh, I would like to give you an example for uh, post-structuralism, that is a deconstruction, okay? Uh, deconstruction, post-structuralism, uh, more or less uh, one and the same. It, it, you should not get confused with that, okay? But uh, post-structuralism has given one more concept, one more uh, ideology, the one more term is deconstruction, okay? Yes, there is a sentence I have given you, pass me the sugar. You are all, your friends, okay, you are all sitting uh, across the time table across the dining table, and then you ask uh, your friend to pass me the sugar. You say that, pass me the sugar. And what is the surface reading of this particular uh, uh, f f statement that is a pass me the sugar? You find that I want sugar, one meaning. Or else I need sugar. Or else I need more sugar. Or else I like to add more sugar in a cup of coffee. 
this is the surface level of the meaning okay but when you apply this deconstructive reading that is the binary opposition the deconstructive reading that is a one signifier leads to another signifier the another signifier leads to yet another signifier like that you find that i find fault with the cook it just understand when you say that pass me the sugar that means you find fault with the cook and another thing is the coffee is not tasty the coffee is not tasty so this is what we call deconstructive reading like that there are number n number of books n number of uh, things about deconstruction if you read along with the basic concepts basic i mean i am talking about the simplification of literary things okay when you have all these things and then you read that the deconstructive readings and especially the books written by uh, paul de man i'll tell you that who is paul de man and so on okay uh, this is what we call the deconstructive reading you understood i think you would have understood yes and then yale critics yale critics uh, for deconstruction yale critics are very much uh, uh, widely uh, accepted the first one is uh, jack derrida jack derrida if you want to understand jack derrida there is a dictionary called uh, derrida dictionary there is a dictionary called derrida dictionary uh, another uh, book is also there another book is also there derrida dictionary by naya lucy okay you uh, and and then three important books written by derrida you please have that and and understand yes speech and phenomena speech and phenomena one first book the another book is of grammatology it is translated it is translated by gayatri spayak chakravarti into english okay another book is uh, uh, what they say writing and difference writing and difference speech and phenomena and then uh, of grammatology postcard positions and these books are written by jack derrida if you have these books please read and understand what is the concept really your understanding will be something different you definitely you will see each and every uh, a piece of literature in a different manner if you read it derrida first of all and another book is written by paul the man is uh, uh, allegories of reading it's very important book by uh, paul the man the allegories of reading that is available in the internet also and then jeffrey hartman harold bloom and hillis miller hillis millers the whole critic as a host you please read at least this one the critic as a host okay and then uh, this is what we call that deconstruction and that is uh, post structuralism okay now we can pass on to new historicism new historicism is uh, um against new criticism what is new criticism new criticism reject i mean uh, rejects history it new criticism rejects the biography of the author new criticism rejects uh, the historical perspectives and historical dimensions but whereas the new historicism i am talking about new historicism it accepts history it rereads history okay it rereads the history it accepts the history and it gives historical interpretations and so on and then um, uh, it accepts the history and rereading history and the politics is very important that is a politic political reading political reading how politics uh, has influenced uh, the readers mind and so on i tell you that this new historicism is a prince of all literary theories it is it is a prince of all literary theories it is a kind of reading method it is a kind of reading method and the father of new criticism is uh, stephen green black stephen green black is called the father of new criticism and then uh, what he says is every text belongs to its time and history we say that shakespeare is man of all ages but according to this new historicism shakespeare is not a man of all ages because he belongs to he elizabethan era only his writings belongs to I mean all the writings of shakespeare belong to the um, era of elizabethan era or uh, era of uh, renaissance and so on because the language is there the language of elizabethan era is given in this particular mm-hmm. book okay the history is uh, depicted in the particular book and and so on so and then every uh, text belongs to its time understand and then 
it is very important book please 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 you please read this uh, by stephen greenblatt that is a uh, renaissance self fashioning from more to shakespeare if you have this you please read about uh, new historicism and so on what is the aim of new historicism new historicism it is the aim the, the, that aim is nothing but a parallel reading of literary text and non literary text you cannot read only the literary text you cannot read that non literary text be a parallel reading of literary and non literary text say for example after 30 years or 40 years our generation definitely will read a poem on 19 1919 a novel on 19 a drama on 19 what does it mean 19 in 2019 there was a global pandemic called the covid 19 automatically that readers in our future generation people they come to the history they come to the history and then they read uh, historical perspectives and non literary texts like uh, newspapers magazines time magazines and uh, india today magazine and world health organizations uh, history and everything they would uh, study that and then they will understand what happened in 2019 so this novel talks about this particular drama talks about this particular poem talks about the covid 19 that is why we have 19 like that so this is what i tell you that it is a parallel reading of for literary and non literary text so this is what we call that new historicism so history is very important to understand a concept clearly that's why i told you that it is a prince of all the literary theories new historicism is i give you the example for literary and non literary text merchant of venice is a literary text and things fall apart and solitary reaper and the non literary text we have that newspapers and uh, historical events and numismatics and scriptures and music and painting and so on so we can have the parallel reading of a literary text along with the non literary text according to uh, new historicism text that the word very word that very word text that gives any word or any object say for example if i am talking about this mouse no if it is also a text because it is also a text because it gives information okay it gives information if i it information to the people and if i say that the yeah, watch watch also gives an info it, it gives a piece of information to the readers to the people so it becomes a text according to the new historicism okay emw tilts the elizabethan world picture this is a very basic book which talked about the historical connotations and the historical events in the elizabethan era only the history but not in the form of uh, uh, the parallel reading and so on actually this uh, new historicism is originated from deconstructive reading what deconstruction said it is aporia no no reading is a final no reading is a final and uh, all readings are uh, provisional i told you no in the earlier uh, slide we saw that like that this a little bit the history is questioned history is questioned who has written what is the aim of writing this like that the history is questioned and here you find my dear friends two key concepts in a new historicism the first one is clifford creates thick description thick description is uh, uh, created by gilbert ryal but it is completed by clifford greaves what does it mean is it talks about the strata of meaning in the society it has strata of meaning in society and then it is constituted from various segments and the structure of history and structure of society and so on and then uh, another point is uh, that is a key point is meta history meta which means what about okay meta which means about it is uh, uh, in metaphysics we say that beyond nature okay beyond the cosmos i understand that but whereas here meta which means about about history history about history so they are going to reread history rewrite history so that is the point here we say that meta history and then actually this meta history was the first uh, for I mean for the first time it was used by natra fry natra fry and uh, it is widely used by hadden okay it is widely used by hadden you find that i give you one statement uh, that is a meta history asks questions about the structure of historical consciousness it asks the questions about the structure of historical consciousness about the epistemological status of historical explanations the epistemological status of historical explanations what is right and what is wrong what is the knowledge 
What is the knowledge here in the historical explanations? All these things are given. And then about the forms of historical representation, about the forms of a historical representation, all these things are given in this uh, meta history. That is why uh, we uh, must understand these two concepts before it uh, plunge into uh, this one uh, new historicism. And new historicism has another dimension called the cultural materialism. Uh, it is another dimension and it is a progress in new historicism. And uh, Jonathan Dalimer and Alan Sinfield, both they have written a book called, yep, I mean, that is a political Shakespeare. Political Shakespeare in the sense, in the writings of Shakespeare, in the time of Shakespeare, what was the political reason? But the political reason is nothing but the colonization and so on. No? Like that, it went on. And then Graham Holden is, you know, new historicism is a political form of a historiograph. Historiography in the sense how a person writes a history. This is what we call a historiography. It is a political form of a historiography and so on. It is told by Graham Holderness. And then Louis Montreux says in his uh, essay called uh, Professing the Renaissance, the Poetics and the Politics of a Culture. This essay is uh, found in the book called uh, um, New Historic, a Reader, New Historicism. Okay, it is written by uh, Visa. It is written by Visa. You please uh, uh, find this particular essay and please read, read, read this particular essay to understand what is uh, a real new historicism you'll understand. He says that historicity of text and textuality of history. Here you find that historicity of text. It refers to the relationship between a text and society and it refers to the time in which the text is written in which the time is, uh, the text is written. How that uh, in, in this particular time, the text is written, this is what we call the relationship between the society. The relationship between the society and the text is called historicity of the text. Okay, then in the textuality of history, here you find another point of deconstruction, that is a nihilism. Nihilism is a questioning, a questioning about what went wrong. Okay, in a negative manner, it questions. In a negative concept, it questions and so on. So here we find that questions like historical references, background, everything. Because the historiography is there. The writer ha can write on his own bias. Okay, on his own bias, the writer would have uh, uh, written a history and so on. So that is why history becomes his story. His story in the sense the writer's history, the writer's uh, uh, subjective understanding, Subjective weaving about the historical event, events. These are given in the form of a book. So this is why the method, that is what we call that the historicity of a text and textuality of a history. Okay, yes. And another thing is uh, uh, the next slide we can pass on to postmodernism. Postmodernism actually it uh, uh, it is an extension of modernism, and then uh, it, it it came from this particular. Uh, uh, term called modernism came from modernist. It is a Latin word. It is a Latin word, and then postmodernism is coined by Arnold Arnold Toynbee. And for modernism, we have uh, T. S. Eliot. T. S. Eliot, Marx, Karl Marx. T. S. Eliot is for literature. Karl Marx for social economics. Okay, sociology and social economics. Albert Einstein, uh, he is known for theory of relativity and he is called MC Squared. And Sigmund Freud, he is known for uh, psychiatric books. And uh, uh, the, these are all very famous uh, writers of uh, modernism. And uh, T.S. Eliot's modernism, and uh, uh, what we say is uh, that book is uh, The Wasteland. The Wasteland, it is very great, it is a very great example for modernist technique and modernist ideology, and so on. So, T.S. Eliot, Eliotization is a term, another term is Eliotization in literature. Eliotization in literature, in the sense, you uh, all on a sudden you cannot read this wasteland. Okay, it is very difficult to understand because it has lots of references from uh, biblical references and uh, uh, mythological references and uh, sociological references and everything. For each and every word, you need to understand that uh, uh, with, the, with the assistance of reference, with the assistance of reference, you will read all the things and all the uh, writings of T.S. Uh, uh, especially in Wayne's land. So what I tell you is, it is a grand narration. If Eliot's uh, wasteland 
actually this wasteland is uh, termed as a grand narration okay it is called a meta narration so against the meta narration against the grand narration only we have post modernism we have post modernism yes because of the scientific development uh, in uh, uh, many of the clings to to put in the I mean, many of the clings across the world across the world um, uh, have been taken place have been taken based on so on and then um, another point i would like to tell you is my dear friends i english high english high modernist Uh, there he comes first. That is, T. Uh, S. Eliot comes first. James Joyce, Ezra Pound, Virginia yeah, Woolf, and so on. And uh, French uh, high modernists we have uh, uh, Marcel Roust and uh, Stephen Mallarmé, and then uh, Franz Kafka. These are all uh, French high modernists. Okay. And then postmodernism started in 1960s. And then uh, Charles Jenks has uh, given uh, the architectural postmodernism. in the book called the language of post modern architecture in 1977 and uh, it talks about the accepts the radicalism and playfulness it accepts radicalism and playfulness and then it rejects okay it rejects the universality and oneness there is no oneness there is no universality the local color is associated the locality the local feelings the local idea the local concept is vehemently a celebrate vehemently celebrated this is what we call post modernism first of all and this man the jean francois lyotard jean francois lyotard is called the father of post modernism and in fact he has written a book called the post modern condition a report on knowledge it means if you have the book it please read and understand it is a bible for post modernism first of all is a bible and another book written by uh, mr jean jean francois lightbot is a liberal economy he talks about marxism and how marxism has uh, incorporated in a post modernism and so on but here he gives the three meanings for post in post modernism the first one is a inauguration the new generation the second one is humanity and the third one is analysis what went wrong in mass modernism and so on and another writer leslie fielder is fielder <laughs> Say that is a, that is a, a critical essay. Uh, the critical essay's name is "Clouds the Power and Clouds the Cap." In this particular essay, if you if you have this essay, please read and you, if, uh, read this, you will understand the best. But your the voice best. is breaking. Voice is breaking, sir. Kindly unmute your audio, please. We are checking. Sir, excuse me, sir. Very many, sir. Yes, yes, yes. is breaking sir is my voice breaking hello sir very many sir sir excuse me yes, sir yes ma'am yes 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 is my voice audible to you sir your your audio is breaking sir participants please uh, mute your audio first of all i think uh, you are all educated you are all educated so you please uh, mute your uh, audio and if you are interested in my webinar uh, please you please if you are not interested in my webinar 
so i think you are all like educated i do not know it happens uh, why it happens i do not know uh, but anyway uh, it is a kind of a meta webinar meta webinar in the sense it's like a uh, uh, you are uh, uh, inducing me and you are telling me that i am giving webinar so this is what we call meta webinar so for uh, uh, what should i say uh, inducing me and um, uh, say that i am giving a webinar and you are making me alert first of all i tell you that you are making me alert okay thank you very much thank you for your assistance i thank you for your um what should i say uh, anyway anyway my dear friends please uh, meet your audio the others can uh, get benefited if you are not able to get benefited the others can get benefited yeah, you should not uh, be the obstacle for others uh, learning others learning it is a crap okay anyway yes here the western is nothing but the red indians attitude the western is nothing but that uh, uh, it, it is not that western culture and so on but it talks about the west indians okay red indians red indians in the sense they are uh, experiencing and uh, doing the uh, local color the local activities as they have won they are praising they have the local activities and so, and so on so that is the point and then science fiction science fiction is uh, you, you, if you read science fiction you will understand and you will uh, uh, something uh, you are in an imaginary world you are in an imaginary world and so on and then little photography literally photography is uh, uh, some writers they have written on this particular uh, concept for uh, um, promoting him himself or herself as a uh, writer and so on and then what light art says is light art jean francois light art says it is an incredulity towards meta narratives what it says is uh, it means the incredulity um, uh, towards meta narratives meta narratives is nothing but ts eliot's wasteland is uh, meta narratives because if you find the uh, is mean uh, the mythological narration the biblical references and very difficult to understand very difficult to understand so when you have much more knowledge about uh, all these uh, biblical understanding and uh, uh, cross from mythology and culture only then you are able to understand this ts uh, eliot's wasteland so that is what we call meta narration so uh, postmodernism is against narration okay so that postmodernism gives little narration the very small narration little narration it's like a pulp fiction anybody can read and understand it is uh, that pulp fiction is available uh, to anybody else okay so that is the point is then budhila uh, says uh, is a uh, very important book is small karan simulations small karan and he is uh, and he is uh, uh, the man known for virtual reality okay virtual human virtual reality and so on and he says anything in anything it goes post modern anything it goes in the sense it accepts everything whatever you do in the form of post modernism it accepts the particular uh, era okay that is the point then uh, it is uh, some sort of post modernism i give you that as a meta fiction and uh, historiographic fiction and fragmentation for fragmentation salman rush is uh, the midnight children you have that uh, fragmentation and then deconstructive reading you find that um intertextuality jova is the father of intertextuality she coined that uh, the term called intertextuality and allusion allusions are from various sources and then hyper reality okay hyper reality is also known for uh, uh, this man jean budla okay jean budla and then uh, uh, yes uh, you find that the difference between modernism and post modernism i, I think my webinar will be the differentiation between the modernism and post modernism along with this uh, i have hasan's differentiations i have hasan's differentiation how the romanticism is there modernism is there in modernism and then how paraphysics paraphysics which means uh, the imaginary science 
solutions to imaginary problems and how the rise is there and play chance and combine find that video like desire and schizophrenia irony and immanence so these are all indeterminacy these are all the postmodern concepts okay you please read this one are available on the net and a few postmodern writers i would like to mention here jean paul and spinchen and then uh, peter arkwright and etaro calvino stachitaro and then simon resti and then here uh, before uh, reading the postmodern writers writing you have certain knowledge about the postmodern critics points of view critics understanding it is the kind of uh, methodology to read postmodern writings okay uh, it is uh, jean francois and jean boudella michel foucault michel foucault's very important uh, book is uh, uh, order of things okay uh, order of things but uh, the clinic you please uh, read this michel foucault and roland barthes already i explained to you and then guy de luz and gatari guy de luz and philip gatari they have uh, written a book called the second take yes and anti oedipus uh, it runs around the 650 pages around okay it is very essential book for understanding about the uh, rise of rise okay there is no beginning and there is no end so this is what we call that uh, post modern writing and post modern feature and then jürgen habermas this man number 7 you habermas says modernity is an incomplete project there is an essay written by jürgen habermas that is modernity is an incomplete project in this uh, essay is understand um, you will uh, have much more uh, understanding about modern is modernity and julia christopher jack derrida and i mean frederick jameson he is a first postmodern critic in america and uh, uh, logical or culture of logic of capitalism is written by frederick jameson please read this particular book and so on so with this i complete the postmodernism and i pass on to the next one is post colonialism post colonialism it is based politics linguistic science and uh, economic factors and geopolitics these are all the family i mean uh, the base lines for uh, post colonialism and so on and then this man franz fanon he is a psychiatric person psychiatric doctor and he has written a book the politics of europe in 1961 it, this book says about the theories of uh, the third world country third world country theories of third world country you please read this particular book that is the rest of the earth and then another book is the empire rights back it is written by bill ascraft and et al okay the other writers they have contributed their writings to this the empire rights back and so on and then the theories of post colonialism who are the trinities of post colonialism gomi ke baba edward said as the first five of chapter worthy these three are the trinities of post colonialism and now the gomi ke Uh, he was a born indian he was a born indian and he <coughs> what he has written a book called is uh, nation and narration in this book nation and narration uh, he uh, said about the nation is uh, nation is an imagined community nation is an imagined community but everywhere you find the people only why do you say that nation and so it is a hybridity he says he has given this concept called the hybridity in post colonialism now at this particular 21st century we have a hybridity not the hybridity we have a hybridity and so on and then it was said and it is a very important book is uh, orientalism and orientalism which consists which is jump packed with the western principles and how western principles they have dominated the eastern principles and so on so these concepts are given in the colonialism by edward said and then uh, colonizers uh, color and epistemic influence actually colonizers they came with uh, certain um, uh, dogmas and then they uh, been uh, dominated as dominated as especially uh, we also dominated by british empire yes and then religious dogmas and christianity created in a uh, uh, post uh, colon i mean colonized countries okay colonized countries this man is uh, an african social thinker what he says about the post colonialism and colonies he just read and understand when they arrived i mean that uh, colonies okay when they arrived we had the land we had the land we have our own lands okay and then they had their bible 
they had their own bible okay when they arrived what happened after that they told us to close our eyes they told us to close our eyes in the sense they mesmerized us they mesmerized us and so on and after that you find that they had the land we had the people they had the land they had our lands we have their bible so it is a kind of a colonization this is what we call the religious dogma religious dogma is also one of important factors to colonize to colonize your country okay and then i would like to take this very famous example for a, a private people can say this particular example is the shakespeare's tempest prospero is the master he is an english man caliban is a slave he is a, uh, he is an indian and he is a native person of that particular island okay and this caliban says towards uh, uh, prospero prospero is a uh, master and caliban is slave towards the is a slave his master caliban says what does he says you thought language how to curse upon you this is what we call you taught me language you taught me english language you taught me how to be here you taught me everything but we are using the same technique to curse upon you so that is the point here about post colonialism and salman is in midnight children you find that chatification chatification there is a concept there is an idea Uh, there is this is a term uh, created by Salman Rushdie. He got to say that uh, in uh, uh, English language, that, that is the culture is uh, mixed with culture is mixed with Indian culture and uh, British culture it is mixed with uh, in this particular uh, uh, country. And at the same time, uh, he has uh, uh, written English language with the amalgamation of uh, two sentences, uh, two words together. Three words together in order to say that they decolonize the English. In order to say that it is a decolonized English and so on. And there are two key concepts of uh, post-colonialism. The first one is ambivalence. Ambivalence is a psychological one, and uh, it is a double-powered uh, thing. Double-powered thing. And uh, he says is a comic Baba. He takes the example from Charles Grant. Charles what? Charles Grant. Charles Grant. Who in 1792 he desired Charles Grant desired to inculcate the Christian religion in Indians. He wanted to inculcate the Christian religion in uh, Indians, but worried that this might uh, make them turbulent for their life. You find that double power, ambivalence is double power. Charles Grant first. Wanted to inculcate. He wanted to foist upon Christianity. Okay, he wanted to uh, bring about the Christianity to the Indian people, and then he thinks that immediately thinks that it may affect their liberty and so on. So uh, domination and liberty, you find that domination and liberty. These two things are called double power. These two things are called double power. This is what we call ambivalence in the uh, post-colonial point of view. And then uh, mimicry. What is mimicry? I am able to do what you did. Okay, that is the point. Is mimicry. And then menace. Menace is a. Uh, it's a kind of warning. I am able to harm against you. I am able to do anything, whatever you did. So it is a kind of a warning message to colonizers. Warning message to the colonizers. So this is what we call that post-colonialism. With this, I complete. Post-colonialism, and then I begin with uh, uh, my session. That is, uh, uh, sir, excuse uh, me, sir. Uh, yes, yes. Sir, kindly check yes, your internet connection, sir. Your voice is breaking, sir. Your voice, voice is breaking. Breaking, sir. Yes. Is my voice clear, madam? Is my voice audible? Um, audible, sir, but it's not Hello? clear, sir. What, what, what do I do? Everything is uh, properly connected. Everything is properly connected. Maybe somebody could write now. Is my voice audible? You are audible, sir, but your voice is not clear, sir. Not clear. Yes, sir. 
it's not clear uh, yes sir Let's start, sir. Are you able to? Yes, I can begin. I can this. Okay. Uh, is my voice clear, ma'am, right now? No, sir. Is my voice clear right now? No, sir. I do not know what happens, but everything is connected okay, properly. Okay, sir. Let's continue, sir. We can continue, sir. Everything is connected properly. I do not know where the problem lies. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, I begin. I, I complete this one. Okay. Okay, sir. Hello. I completed this one. The last one is feminism. Uh, feminist criticism is uh, uh, widely uh, spoken. Widely spoken, and even men also speak about feminism and so on. Um, there are lots of movements for feminism and so on. Um, here we find that uh, it is uh, 14th century uh, Christ and Deep Design. Okay, uh, she has written a book called the Book of the City of the Ladies. The Book of the City of Ladies actually it started in a. Uh, 14th century also, and then modern feminism started in 18th century, uh, and then uh, Charles the Fourier has written, I'm sorry, has, has, um, <clears throat> uh, has called feminism for the first time in the French language. And then in 1851, uh, we had uh, the feminism uh, in English. We had feminism in English, and then uh, three uh, key points to be discussed in the feminism is political related to everybody. And then uh, uh, we find that strength and weakness of a female and then sexual harassment. So these are uh, major issues in feminism. And the difference between feminism and kind of criticism is uh, feminism is nothing but the either female writer or male writer, they can talk about the feminism. They can talk about feminism, especially the women, they can uh, uh, model, they can uh, do their uh, uh, writings. They can do their writings on the basis on the model of uh, uh, male writing. Whereas gyno criticism, how they feel and what they feel, how they exactly feel, all these things are expressed in a kind of criticism. Okay, and then in 1970, women liberation movement started, and it has given more power for other movements also. Mary Wollstonecraft on marriage, she says that marriage is a form of legal prostitution, like that, that is a one ideology. Okay, and then uh, two critics and writers on feminism. The number one is uh, Simon D. Boober, and she has written a book called The Second Sex. And in the book, what she says is, one is not born, comma, rather, comma, becomes comma, a woman. You find the commas between words. It has given uh, a strength to a strength to feminism. That is, one is not born, Okay, uh, every, everyone is equal, everybody is equal, but rather, but the society, okay, but the society, something happens, becomes the afflictions of the society, okay, becomes a woman. So that is the point. So everybody is equal, but in the society, people create that she is a woman, she is a girl, like that. You like to what I say? In her book, that is a like story. Stories and she has given a number of concepts about feminism and so on, and then waves of feminism. The first wave of feminism is it started in 19th and 20th century and it is based on the oppression. And it is uh, talking about women did not have uh, um, uh, casting votes, they did not have the rights of casting votes and so on, they did not have the rights to division, they uh, act as a wife in a uh, domestic uh, uh, situation, in a domestic scenario. They can be a mother, they can be a wife, that's all. They do not have 
but divorcing rights okay rape is not an offense in a conjugal way right from you said just said how female is uh, dominated so in the, in the sector of feminism we find that rights to education it is a more it is developed okay and the divorce is not respectful okay and then they can divorce uh, divorce their husband but in the society she is not respected properly so that is the point here the third one is called as success and then movements of feminism have been flourished movements of feminism have been flourished and equal to men and the government also gives certain laws and the concepts and the rules of case and amendments for uh, protecting women and and so on and then uh, the three literary phases of feminism the first the phase is the feminine phase here female writers followed the male writers model first of all they followed the writing style of male they followed the writing techniques of male and so on and uh, actually male writers are female writers, female writers are dominated even in the writing okay and then uh, the feminist phase it started, actually it talks about the radical thinking and leading position at the leading position in the sense they have the position of leader position of leader and then women are acknowledged as thinkers first of all in the feminist phase the women are acknowledged thinkers and then in the uh, female phase the female phase what that it is a real development they oppose the writings of men okay they write their own experience their own feelings their own hatred express expressions Here we find that the kind of criticism. Okay, the kind of criticism is how a female feels, how a female uh, expresses, and uh, his hatred and everything is expressed in the writings. This is what we call that the female face. Female face is success. Various kinds of feminism, socialist feminism. It uh, actually Juliet Mitchell. Uh, essay called the women the longest revolution in that uh, essay he said is the responsibilities and the representation of a woman in the society uh, these things are depicted in a social feminism and the radical feminism it is about the marxian influence and agitations are uh, uh, rightful to female and the feminism it is also termed by uh, hans sisos in uh, the story of the law of the medusa law of the medusa actually it started in uh, 1970s and then he talks about the physical differences okay uh, and after that uh, liberal feminism uh, uh, liberal feminism tong says the society has a false belief that uh, women are by less intellectually and less physically capable than men it is the false notion and then the feminism and then we have black womanist feminism existential feminism equal feminism uh, then postmodern feminism and so on so with this uh, i complete my presentation and i thank each and everyone and i thank the participants and i thank the Officers and thank the departments and so on for having given me this wonderful opportunity to share my views about literary theories. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, thank you so much, sir. for your effort for our webinar sir thank you madam thank you any questions no sir okay, thank you uh, i would like to thank our management and our principal and our man my dear colleagues and my beloved sir guide uh, mr m krishna sir for your support kind support uh, and thank you all all the participants uh -huh. Uh, sorry for the technical issues i will send the feedback form in the whatsapp group sir thank you so much sir you put a very effort sir thank you thank you madam thank you so much sir okay, no questions uh, no questions sir uh, for okay, no. participants are asked for technical issues only sir that's why they are unable to ask questions sir okay If they ask a question, okay. means I will share it to you, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir.
Okay. Okay.